Welcome to The Outliers Inn, produced by the Operational Excellence Society and sponsored by Zonotech Consulting Group International, with your hosts, Joseph Paris and David Schneider. Well, hey there, everybody. Welcome to another Outliers Inn. I'm your host, Mule. On the other side of the planet is JP. Hey, how's it going, Mule? Good to see you, everybody. Uh, it's been going well here in uh, Virginia, nice and hot and sweaty and sunny outside. Uh, how are you doing? I, are, you're back in Germany now after being in the Southeast for a yeah, while. Yeah, I, I actually just arrived back to Germany not uh, six hours ago. Uh, took a nap, so I was a little bit as fresh as possible for, for this recording. But yeah, I was uh, spending about the four weeks in uh, just outside of Orlando, Florida. And uh, I got to tell you, freedom, freedom, freedom. I mean, no masks, love DeSantis, hate to get political, but this is not about political. This is about like, wow, it was just great to, you know, take the mask off and be real again and, you know, go to the restaurants and go to, you know, outings and events. Um, but what was really interesting was the trip back. Um, <clears throat> I don't know, you know, I, I'm probably mentioned this, but getting, going across the borders, you know, from the U S to the EU or the EU to the U S there's a lot of paperwork involved, less so from the EU to the uh, U S basically all you have to do is have a right to be here. In other words, you know, be a citizen, a green card holder, or married to a citizen or a green card holder, and have a negative COVID test, which, by the way, they've changed to an antigen, which is nice, not a PCR. It used to be a PCR that was required. Now it's just an antigen, which is faster and cheaper. Um, uh, you know, so it's easy coming from Europe to the U.S., but going from the U.S. to Europe, for me, is, is quite challenging. First off, you have to have a test negative test result, um, 48 hours, no, uh, taken no greater than 48 hours before you arrive, where the States is 72 hours before you leave. All right. And then in my case, I have to have a bunch of paperwork, like, you know, marriage certificate and blah, blah, blah. Yeah, just like, it's about a quarter inch, you know, the Germans like their, their paperwork. So I always have this, this paperwork with me and you have to have a registration form and you have to have this and that and the other thing. And, uh, and so I had all that, you know what I mean? Cause I'm very proud of these, these, these document packets that I put together because they're <laughs> perfect. Okay. It's like, you know, yeah, get me mad. It's, a, is, it's, it's the Nordgun. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> exactly. It's all about the Ordnun. So I got all this stuff and I'm, you know, coming you out, know, the, the, the test is done and, you know, I, I get, I get to Germany and I give him my passport and I start taking out all this paperwork and the guy at passport control says, I don't need any of that. Nine. It's like, what? And, so, and now, now I'm like, dude, you know how much effort it took for me to create these freaking perfect packet of documents? You got to look at it. You got to please, please give me a star. I want a gold <laughs> star on this packet of papers. You know what I mean? I worked so hard. And, and, um, and his answer was nine. No, no I, I, you know, I was just going to, you know, if he doesn't want to see it, I wasn't going to see it. But this is what I'm thinking about in the yeah. back of my head. It's like I did all this work to, to have this perfect document and, and it's in perfect order and he doesn't want to see it. So, you know, the, the sands are shifting so quickly that it's hard for anybody to know what the real requirements are anymore, anywhere. Yeah. You know what I mean? And, uh, you know, this brings us actually a, a bit to our, the subject of today, right? You know, uh, the theme of our, uh, today's show is, you know, planning. Well, yeah, I mean, the, com the, the, com the, the, you know, confusion behind it because everything keeps changing. What's the last minute, everything, everything else. Uh, you know, a couple of weeks ago, I was in Atlanta. I went down to for a quick trip and I got invited to go to dinner one night and then go to the baseball game. And I was expecting the baseball game not to be very crowded at all. And when we got there, it really wasn't. There was very few people in the stands. But by the end of the first inning, the place was packed. I mean, it was packed. And what was really striking to me was is masks were the exception. Yeah. Everybody was unmasked. And uh, at the restaurant the night before for dinner, everybody was unmasked except for the servers. All the servers were wearing masks, but everybody else that was there, no masks. Yeah. And, it, it, and I came here from Virginia where still you see a lot of people walking around the sidewalks with them on. But you go into any store here and you, the 
mask required sign is still up, except for Sheets, Sheets gas stations. They, their sign says, it's your call. Yeah. You know, it's funny because you're, you're right. The, you know, the signs in Florida still said masks required. Everybody just ignored it. Maybe they mm. just didn't get a chance to take the mask, the, the signs down, um, it, which is entirely you know probable. But or even at the it. airport, even at Orlando airport, you know, airports are federal facilities. Yeah. Even at the Orlando airport, people were not wearing their masks. And I found that, you know, remarkable. Um, you know, they're just done with it. They're, they're, you know, it, it's all 2020 as far as they're concerned. You know, one of the interesting observations I also had was, is, you know, this was a baseball game. You drink beer, baseball game, you yeah. eat hot dogs at a baseball game. Uh, I'm used to sitting in the stands and there's dudes that bring you beers and you give them money and they give you a beer and there's dudes who will bring you popcorn and hot dogs and all the rest of that. There weren't any of these guys there, or there were very few of them. Yeah. Uh, and the one that I did snag and bought a couple of beers from, I, I, I said, you know, there's not, there's almost none of you guys here. I didn't think that there were any. He said, I don't understand it because, you know, I pulled down like $35, $40 an hour doing this. That's crazy. And he, he said, you know, yeah, but I'm like one of six guys hauling beer around here. There's no hot dog guys. There's no lemonade guys. There's no ice cream guys. Right. And what that meant was, is yeah, the stadium was packed, but the concession lines snaked all over the place and forget any social distancing in that environment. It's a nice big ballpark, but oh right. yeah. Right. Yeah. There wasn't any of that going on. So, you know, the, the, the volatility, how do you staff for something like that? Well, and get yeah. people to, to show up to work. Well, you know, first off, you've got to make it more attractive for them to work than to not work. Okay. Yeah. So that's a fundamental problem. Um, speaking of, uh, you know, concessions and whatnot, I, I do have one last little anecdote here. I had my first Chick-fil-A sandwich when I was in Orlando. Okay. The first one, you know, it's like sheltered you hear, life. it was a sheltered life that I have been leave, leaving. Yes. Um, and, uh, and so, you know, I, I, I had my first sandwich and they're like, which one do you want? I said, well, whatever one made you guys famous is the one I, I want. So they gave it to me. And sure enough, I took my first bite and felt the love of Jesus and America running through me. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, they, they, th those folks down there in Atlanta know how to move some things because, mm. uh, uh, the joke was for a long time, you want, uh, you want the testing lines or the inoculation lines to work uh, efficiently, uh, go get the Chick-fil-A folks. Dude, you're so right. It was like, oh my God, I've never seen a drive through that was so packed. And these guys were like shuffling through there like nobody's business. Like, you know, if, if Aldi served like fast food, it would be like, these would be the checkout people. It was yeah. amazing. Yeah. Yeah, I, it, it, it's a machine. They yeah. have developed a machine. <laughs> it's so, amazing. Yeah. So yeah, it's a really hard to uh, you know plan. You know, we're you know today's theme is is uh, you know a VUCA world, and you know just for those people that don't don't you know uh, it's an acronym. Uh, VUCA is an acronym. V U C A for volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity. Okay, and. You know, I, I think that we could all uh, take uh, on faith, on face value, that, you know, the circumstances of today are not nearly as predictable and stable as they were five years ago or 15 years ago or 30 years ago. I mean, things are, are multifaceted and running in real time. I mean, heck, David, you know, you're in the logistics business, you know. Uh, the, 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 um, the global economy really didn't come into play until 1990. You know, yeah. so we're still feeling our way. And, and now, you know, influences that we didn't necessarily predict or even have on our radar are making our planning or influencing our planning so that um, rigidity in our plan becomes our enemy now. And we have to be flexible uh, in order to be uh, successful. I, what has some of your experiences been? Yeah, well, I, I keep thinking back about some of the stuff that I build and, you know, these big uh, warehouse racking systems. And uh, uh, they have to be rigid to be able to support the massive amounts of weight that they have, or else they fall down like a house cards. We've seen plenty of those videos out yes. there. 
But um, uh, for, you know, building these systems in seismic territories, you know, you don't know when the earthquake is going to happen. You just know that it will happen. And you don't know, you don't know how strong it's going to be. You just know that it's going to shake stuff. And so the higher the risk of, of uh, seismic activity, the looser you make the connections in the pallet rack system. And so you design the pallet rack system to actually move. And it was something that I had learned uh, back in the 80s. I got to work on a, on a restaurant project that the building in high winds moved two to three inches. It was California framing. It was designed to move and for seismic. And then that way, uh, you know, the building didn't fall down. It flexed and it moved and nothing broke. It just, you know, adjusted with the change. And so uh, the, I, I carry that back to what you do with plans and that your plans have to have flexibility built into them or they're going to, they're going to fail. You're going to, they'll, they'll be too rigid and stuff doesn't work. Um, you know, if your tolerances are too tight, stuff may not fit and, you know, things change. And so, uh, you know, to deal with that volatility and that uncertainty, you got to have that flexibility designed into the system. Yeah. Um, you know, it's almost like, you know, um, not to, you know, bash on lean, you know, people, you know, lean principles and whatnot, but, you know, if you're too lean, you're going to become unhealthy. You know, the, the body needs a little bit of fat, you know what I mean? A little bit of, uh, of something other than muscle and bone. Otherwise, uh, it's, it's unhealthy. You know, you're just going to be unhealthy. You have no uh, energy and reserves if you need it. Uh, you know, you're, you're balanced precariously health-wise. And I think that's, you know, something that we have to think about when we're coming up with plans, whether it's, you know, inventory management or business plans or even personal plans. It's like, you know, what, um, what is probable? What is possible? What is improbable? What's impossible? You know, when we think about our plans and, you know, we have to think about, you know, what is probable and have contingencies for that if they were to manifest themselves. You know, if it's possible, we, you know, a simple awareness of it is good enough. And everything else is static. You know what I mean? It's just, you know, once we get into the improbable and the impossible, then, you know, we shouldn't, we shouldn't devote too much time and energy to that, um, to addressing that. Otherwise, you know, we'll never make a decision. I have this... Uh, uh, potential client right now in the UK. And, you know, they have, um, you know, a fixed budget for what they want to accomplish. Um, and of course, we all know what fixed budgets mean, right? Just, you know, like, <laughs> approximately. But mm -hmm. um, my biggest concern with them is that they don't know what they don't know so much. That's why they're looking to, to you know, me and my group. Um but my, my concern there is that because they don't know what they don't know, they're going to vacillate and try to understand every nuance. And they'll burn up 25% of their budget in bullshit meetings. Oh, yeah. Trying to understand something that they won't understand. And they need to just release. And that's really my concern is because we will spend more time in meetings, jawboning and not making progress then we will make progress. It's almost like, you know, I don't even care if it's a wrong decision, make a decision, get the forward momentum going and then redirect. Exactly. Exactly. I mean, you know, that's the same thing with uh, software development, the lean and agile software development is that way. Um, I kept thinking about inventory management and you know, anybody, anybody in supply chain that's you know concerned about inventory right now, What's screwing up a lot of uh, of supply chains is is uh, you know inventory stopped moving, right? Um, and you know in inventory management we have something called safety stock. And in the old days it was you know you had a couple of different inventory methods. One was Oswo, and the other one was Fish, and then the other one uh, the third one was uh, uh, just in case. So Oswo is oh shit we're out, and Fish is first in still here. And, you know, you, you had those, you had those two ends of the spectrum. And then in between was, you know, where am I really? Uh, and the uh, just in case uh, really 
uh, is starting to come into play. You're seeing uh, companies fatten up that inventory now. Uh, they were uh, rewarded for thinning that inventory because that improved their cash flow and made their financials look much nicer. But yeah, you're right. You get too thin and just things start going wrong with your body. Well, you get your inventory too thin. You can, you stop making stuff, yeah. i.e. Ford F-150s. Right. You know? Right. So uh, I, you know, I think that that's, that's something that's you know, fairly interesting. I, I know somebody that knows a lot about this inventory management and mismanagement and, and the scariness of going too lean with that inventory. He's sitting around the corner from us right now. Well, why don't we invite him to the show? Yeah, well, we need to. Damien, are you, you know, come on over, bring your beer and let's uh, have a chat. Well, all I have is a little water. I've switched to water, but no, okay. thanks for, thanks for having me. And uh, a couple comments and then I can get to inventory. I like what Joe said about, you know, you got to be, a, everybody wants to be lean, 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 and you got to have a little bit of fat. And, you know, we all, it's been a while since we've seen colleagues. I was at a funeral, uh, one of the managing partners in the consulting company I worked with. And one of my buddies said, oh, Damien, uh, looks like you put on a few pounds there. I said, yeah, I said, I'm just preparing I need to make sure that if I run off the road and have to live off my body for three weeks that I can do it. And I said, I think I'm pretty good. I, I've got, <laughs> I've got enough uh, packed away. And and he thought that was funny, but uh, no, it, exactly. Uh, uh, it, it's, and in the supply chain, we've all grown up with, I, I want, I want the least cost, I need the service level, but I want it at the least cost. And that's that's got a lot of people burnt a little bit. And then it, following the, the VUCA theme, one of the comments I wanted to make that you all have discussed early in the in the in the podcast here is I think there's so many companies, or let me say it this way. 13 years in consulting, somebody said, so what's the secret to consulting? I said, that's very, very easy. You have to find out what is actually going on. Mm -hmm. Because many times, and I think you guys have said it, they really, uh, the, the people that are in charge of running the business, they don't have the level of detail of what's really going on with their profiles, what's really going on with the profitability per channel, per order type. And, and they're making a lot of times broad assumptions. And my belief is once you get down to the details of what's really going on, then the solutions are pretty simple. And to me, I think where people are moving is it's, uh, and I'll, I'll say it this way with, uh, you know, on the PL, everybody, finance has a great PL, but the PL for most companies is a great average that hides everything else underneath it. And most solutions, whether it's, you know, how do you improve your business or how do you prepare it to take on the uncertainty that's going to be upon us for many years now? Uh, I, I think the, the, the answer is you've got to have the details because your solution is not gonna be a either or, it's gonna be some hybrid. And, and like, like you're saying, David, so on the inventory, well, I mean, we know the, the, the big challenge with inventory is you, it comes in a couple buckets. And the one bucket is I've got predictable demand and I, or I have uncertain demand. And what's happened now is almost every there everything has moved from Anything that was in the predictable demand is all in the unpredictable. So your safety stocks, your, your on order, your min max, your economic order coin, all those things are changing based on local. And like you, you guys, we had talked earlier, my experience, and, and, and I came from a, a, a previous company where we had facilities all across the U.S., and what, what was selling and moving and what the customers were doing in New Jersey was different than Dallas, was different than Tampa. 
And I think, I think what we have to do is be able to put systems in place and processes and plans that, like you guys said, that can move. If the wind blows, the building needs to move a little bit. If a big semi goes across the bridge, the bridge moves a little bit so it can take the change but not break. Right, right. I mean, exactly. You know, it's, it's, it's funny that I was, uh, I wanted to order a dozen wings, okay, in Florida. And I couldn't believe that they're selling a wing for a buck and a half a piece. And, and I, don't, I don't know what happened to, to all the chicken wings in the States. But we have to, you know, thinking about this, it's certainly a supply chain issue someplace, whether it's production or, uh, you know, at the very early stage of the chicken or, you know, some way along the way before it gets on the shelf. You know, somebody um, missed the boat with the planning of it. And of course, the natural uh, reaction is to increase prices, to reduce demand, you know, to try to find that equilibrium. But what the challenge here is, uh, and you, you you know hit on it there, Damien, is that you know if you need something to produce your product and you don't have it, you don't produce your product. Okay, so how do we balance? How do we balance how much inventory we're carrying versus uh, the risk to our production flow? You know, production activity, and you know I, I think of uh, of it almost as self insuring. You know, if I have a contract with you, Damien, you're supposed to, you know, supply me with 100 sheets of steel a week, all right? Um, and you don't, and that's our contract, and you don't, I can sue you, okay? Because we had a contract, all right? So say I sue you. What good does that do? I have now ceased production, okay? My clients aren't getting the product they want or expect from me. I might get sued by them, okay? And the only people that get rich are the lawyers, right? So... What would it take pragmatically to say, you know what, in case there is this challenge to my inventory, I am going to self-insure. And the way I'm going to self-insure is just by simply carrying a little bit more inventory. Oh, yes. You know, it's, it's the cheapest way. But, you know, because of conventional wisdom over the course of the last you know, couple of decades about being lean and just in time, you know, it works until something upsets the delicate balance that makes it all work. And, uh, you know, it's, uh, you know, the butterfly theory there, you know, flaps its wings. And next thing you know, you got a hurricane in Florida. Um, you know, it's like we have to think beyond um, the absolute and the scientifically perfect because we live in the real world. We don't live in perfect. We live in, in the real world. Uh, Joe, yeah, well, every... I, let me give you this example real quick. And, and I think it can be about the planning and you guys chime in. So everybody made their budgets, their uh, container budgets for 2021. And I was on the phone call with a prospect and he said, you know, our budgets were based on 2000, 1500 to $2,000, call it $2,000 a container from oh. Hong Kong to Port of LA. Oh. And big, big retail. And then I, I said, so what are you doing today? He goes, well, he goes, that container is now $13,000 if, if you can get it. Mm -hmm. Holy so shit. What kind? So I will guarantee you that when they were doing the budgeting, because David and I and you got Joe have all been there, no one said, well, what happens if the containers there's a there's an issue and it's six to seven times I, and so I, I'm I'm in, I'm so let let's kind of go back in time and say if we were planning that what would we do to anticipate how we would handle and keep the business running at that kind of rate? Yeah, you know, I've got a, a an example, a live fire example of this. I'm working with a client that. Uh, it's a, a furniture item, it, poofs and ottomans and things like that that have are filled with foam, either big big cubes of foam or uh, uh, these chunks of foam. And uh, they were buying it out of uh, yes, that Asian uh, big Asian country. 
China and, and full containers of this stuff. But now with the price of the containers the way that they are, uh, they were going, you know, we're going to end up having dropped the product. And I said, well, you know, there's companies here in the U.S. that make the foam. And <laughs> all I had to do was say that. All I had to do was say that. And this client picked it up and ran with it. And they, the next day, had identified three different suppliers, had turned around and said, okay, help us figure out the equipment we're going to need to be able to do this ourselves. Uh, help us figure out whether we should just get these chunks of foam pre-cut for us because the vendor has the saws to do it or should we cut it ourselves? And we went through that exercise, took a couple of days. And in the end, they were going, okay, we can, we can do this ourselves. And this is how much it's going to cost. And I, I said, great. When do you want to pull the trigger? And they said, well, it looks like we've got about a three month supply of this stuff already, you know, at ready to go retail. Well, they're, trying so, to look, they're trying to look for perfect, aren't they? Well, they aren't looking for perfect. They're going, uh, we've got two other things to fix and then we got to get this one fixed. So let's, you know, they're moving into a new facility. We're doing the new facility design. Mm -hmm. And so they're going, you know what, what we'll do is we will go out of stock on this for a month or two. On, on some of these SKUs, we'll go out of stock. They have already placed the purchase order for the skins. And so the skins, what would fill a container is a pallet worth of skins. And so now they've shrunk their shipping cost immensely. And in the timing of it, it was like, you know what? We're okay with running out of stock on this because people will still want it. And then when that demand comes back, you know, when we have it back in stock, that demand snaps back. We're not going to jump through hoops to try to fill the, you know, the demand that we're going to miss for maybe six, eight weeks. Yeah. And so some of those trade-offs, you make some of those trade-offs. Mm -hmm. Do I, it's not worth it to try to get that business because I can't do it economically. So I'm out of stock for a little while. Yeah. But what one of my concerns would be by bringing it in house, it's going to require some investment, right? Mm-hmm. But they could also, instead of offshoring it, nearshore it or onshore it. You know, there's people that make this film, I will imagine you said in the States, they mm -hmm. identified three of them. My, my concern would be to make all this investment in this apparatus to make it ourselves. And you know, economics, you know, the pendulum swings, right? And right. it could be six months from now where it's more economical to get it from China again. Maybe. And yep. so that's why the decision was, is not to invest in the saws okay. and the cutting equipment. No, get it pre-cut. Okay. It, the additional cost to get a pre-cut was like 15, 18 cents a unit. Yeah. And so it was such a tiny amount. No, get right, it pre-cut. Right. Yeah. And so the amount of investment in equipment ends up being workbenches, some carts, small, small potatoes. Right. The saws were, would have been, you know, to, to cut this foam and handle the foam uh, would have been a $30,000 investment. Right. So yeah, they avoided the investment by paying the small incremental amount. And it gives them the flexibility that if they switch back, yeah, they could switch back and not have the stranded, the stranded investment. Right, right. Well, that, that would have been my only concern. So what are your thoughts there, Damien? Uh, or well, do you have here's Yes, here's what I was going to say, and and you, and then back to you guys, is, and as we were talking at the beginning of the podcast, I was making some notes. Is I'm going to say that in general, people don't do risk based, mm -hmm. you know, uh, optional planning when they're budgeting and stuff. And the very reason why is the exact example that David gave. And, and, I mean is because, okay, let's convene the top members. Let's get our smartest consultant with us, get, get uh, people that have been in this business, whatever it is. And like, like it or not, I think a lot of people, contingency plan is I'm going to get a lot of smart people in the room. And if it does happen, I'm going to be able to come up with something like Dave just explained. And, and I, I would 
I would uh, present to the group that the, that's how most people, uh, whether it's the CEO or the SVP or the C CLO, say, look, we can't plan for every possible thing that's going to happen. We've got smart people. We're doing some smart things. We've got redundancy. We're not sourcing everything from one country. We're doing this and that so that we can move things around a little bit. And if something crazy happens like a pandemic, I mean, would we really have plans that can handle that? Or do we just react with our best decision at the time? Right, right. And I think what's important is to make those uh, decisions quickly and iteratively. Yes. You know what I mean? Get the momentum going and then redirect. But, you know, there's, there's you know, people will suffer from, uh, you know, paralysis by analysis. You know, oftentimes they're so overwhelmed with the, the inputs, you know, and the variables and the considerations that they make no decisions. And making no decision is also making a decision. But the thing is, uh, if you don't make the decision, somebody else is going to make the decision for you. Absolutely. Or some event is going to make the decision for you. So it's better, I believe, it's better for us to maintain control of the narrative, the tempo, the direction, even if it's not perfect, as long as it's good and we can recognize bad, then everything else will fall into place. Yeah, the, they don't let perfection get in the way of progress. Yeah, exactly right. And, exactly right. you know, so there's that one. I, you know, I, I do these big warehouse projects and, and complex projects. And, and when I'm putting the schedule together, because uh, the schedule ends up being really the, the lifeblood of, of any of these huge automation projects that I do. And I look at the schedule when I'm building it and, I, and I'm asking questions. I have a little sign that's up on my bulletin board by my desk that says, what don't I see? And so I keep looking at what don't I see? What, what risks are out there? What could happen? And then as I think about, well, this could happen, all right, then what's the plan for it? Now, it's not a great detailed plan, but it is, all right, if this happens, then I have this, this, and this. I've got three options, or I've got two options. I think through it, and I write them down. And so when something does go wrong, I've already thought about it going wrong, and I flip through my notes. Oh, yeah, this is, I thought about this. This is what we'll need to do. Now, the planning, sometimes the idea of the plan that I have isn't a perfect fit, but that doesn't matter. I've already thought through it enough that I know how to adjust it to make it work. You know, Eisenhower, plans are everything, but plans are nothing, you know, whatever his line was. Uh, and then uh, uh, Von Mottke, the elder, or no, Von Mottke, the younger, was the one who said all plans disintegrate upon first contact with the enemy. My, my favorite just, is Mike Tyson's. You know, everybody's got a plan until they're plan punched in the mouth. And, yeah. Until they take a punch. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, they're all, they're, they're, you know, all of them are related to it. It yeah. is, you know, have you thought about what could go wrong? And then when you think about what could go wrong, all right, how would you fix it? And now that you've done that little thought exercise, make yourself a note and move on from there. When I'm looking and assessing other projects, the first thing I look at, I don't look at the budget, to hell with the budget. Uh, the budget could be off because of math, because of all sorts of other things. No, what's going on with the schedule? And is, you know, are, are the schedule is, is a matter of, are we doing the right things in the right sequence? And then what things did you not plan for in your schedule? And, you know, what's missing in that schedule. Yeah. And those are the things I look at. But I mean, you know, volatility is always going to be there. Uh, there's always going to be uncertainty and ambiguity. And so in that planning process of the schedule, it's identifying, well, you know what, that's ambiguous. We got to figure that one out. Or that's, we don't know if this is going to happen or if that's going to happen. Don't know. So let's plan for, for both or the third route to happen. And so by going through those exercises, it, it, everybody on the team is ready to, ready to roll with those punches when those punches come. Yeah. 
and you just, you have to go through that exercise. And you know, Damien, you're absolutely right. You put, you part, put your smart people in the room, but you also put some of the folks that are definitely on the front front line that are having to live to, through this. They may not be the most educated, but boy, they are the most experienced with the. Okay, I, I'm glad you said that because of the VUCA. Yeah, I'm glad you said that because you may mention about the smart people in the room, and then getting the people that are on the front line. Like the people on the front line aren't smart. Everybody's yeah. smart. They're different. Everybody's smart. smart. It's okay. different. It's different. Smart. Yeah, it's differently smart. And, you know, if you really want to know what's going on on the shop floor, go out on the shop floor. Talk to the people on the shop floor. They will tell you things um, that that curl will your can, hair. yeah It'll curl your hair. You know, but they'll also give you the aha moments or the validation moments. Um, you know, I I I was working on this project in Florida, and there's a product that they made that they sold for 400 bucks. And I'm looking at this product and just, it just, the, you know, the, the stink test, it didn't pass the stink test. I'm thinking that doesn't cost 400, but it costs more than 400 bucks to make that thing. And the owner of the company didn't want me looking at costs. He just wanted me looking at flow, but I, this was bothering me. Okay. So I enlisted the help of an industrial engineer that they had on staff. And I said, listen, I want you to do a complete time study cost breakdown, time and material overhead based on all current rates, what this son of a bitch and thing may cost to make. And a couple of days later, he gave me probably one of the best reports I've ever seen in my entire life. I mean, complete graphical breakdown of how this thing is made, every process, every move. I mean, everything. It was really incredibly impressive because I'd never asked this of him or anybody there before. So I didn't know what to expect. It could have been just a, a Word document or a spreadsheet, but no, it was really, really cool. Very, very complete. Anyway, come to find out, it looks like they're losing about 350 bucks for every oh. unit that they're making. Oh, okay? stop now. If, you know, honest to God, it's like, you know, instead of it, you know, selling it for 400, it's costing them 750-ish. Um, and it's like, dude, don't even bother making them. Just send your customer a check every month. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's yeah. like, well, take it yourself. off the website. Yeah. Well, no, it's, it's, <laughs> it's specific for a customer. You know, they're, yeah. they're basically a job shop. They, they make the same product all the time for the same customer. Yeah. Uh, you know, but they have different, different products and uh, different product lines. But, you know, come to find out what happened was when they did the original cost analysis, it was like one of these, you know? <laughs> all right. And, uh, and, it's old, so they never updated the material costs. And if you know anything about sheet steel and, and sheet aluminum today, you know, it being, you know, the summer of 2021, you know that it's gone up like 120% over the last six months. All right. They didn't update for that. They, they're using uh, labor and overhead burdens from 2015. Okay. Mm -hmm. And it's like, you know, you, you can't be asleep at the wheel. All right. You know, we live in a VUCA world, but part of our responsibility is to make sure that we don't take our, our eyes off the road. You know what I mean? We're, we're running on our instruments. It's not a surprise. It's been in all the papers that, you know, prices are increasing. Yeah. Okay. It's been, this is so that anybody would, but would have not considered this is, you know, is, is beyond. Uh, well, insane. Uh, What's along that? Along those lines. It's funny. Cause and, and Dave and I've had this discussion if you take people on a tour of a warehouse, they go, oh, let's go see the warehouse. And you say, oh, what do you see? Oh, well, I saw all these parts. Th thing comes in receiving, then it's put away, and then things are picked, and, and they're out. And I said, okay, well, you missed it. I said, did you realize there was four distinct flows of product that went through this building? We had crosstock product. We had product that was put away and then had value added services then was shipped. And it's, it's what you're saying, JP, all of those channels have a different cost structure. For example, everybody goes, all right, it's, oh, you know, my business is down, but I tell you what's saving me, my e-coms up. So I'm not as down as much. Well, I got news for you <laughs> and they probably know but the e-com order is about three times more expensive than the orders that they were shipping to the stores or their distributors. And while they're celebrating, again, 
I think a lot of it comes back to this peanut butter spread, all average. Here's my management labor. Here's my direct labor. Here's my indirect. Here's my DC cost. And here's how much product I shipped. And it's all hidden in there. And you don't have the visibility of those channels to go. But whether it's your example, JP, of the, we're losing money on this one. And, and you know it's going on with many, many companies. And I don't, to be honest, I don't know why people don't look at it more either by customer, by order type, by product type. Those are the three. Well, I, I think that, that that's great input. I think that what it comes down to sometimes is the culture of the company. You know, in, in my case, in this particular company, um, they, they're a sales organization. They want to sell product. They, they measure their, their primary KPIs, believe this or not, their primary KPIs it is how many dollars did I ship today and how many dollars did I ship this month? Okay, how, how much did I ship? All right now, how much did it cost or, or you know, how much profit did I make or any of that? How much, how much top line did I pump out of this building today? Revenue. Revenue, revenue driven. And not and not that I added twenty percent to my inventory costs this month. Right, right, <laughs> yeah, exactly correct. You know, or I ran fifteen percent overtime because all the orders are ecom. Were Were you on this project with me? Because <laughs> because your numbers are spot on. It wasn't ecom, but but you know, uh, yeah, that you know they have a, a, a an inventory issue. I don't, I don't uh, worry too much about the, the increase in the work and process because that's, you know, being a job shop, you know, everything that's in whip is sold. So that, that didn't bother me so much, but raw materials bothered me. The fact that they had a 5%, you know, scrap and rework factor uh, bothered me. Right. Hello. Right. Even Hello. as a job shop, that's, uh, you know, brutal. Um, and I, I told them, I said, you know, they're near, you know, for the last several months, they've been losing money. And they, their response was, if we could, you know, increase our sales this month by 20%, you know, we'll be in the black. And I said, listen, if you increase your sales by 20%, what you're in the red will only increase by 20%. Yeah. Okay. Because you're, you're selling it at a loss. So, so we gave them some corrective action. And hopefully, they'll take advantage of it. And hopefully, it's not too late. But it's, you know, what you measure matters. OK, and you can't measure just one thing. Otherwise, you're just going to get one perspective. And we need a 360 perspective of what our business is doing. You know, what is our you know, direct cost? What is our scrap factor? What is I mean, if I have 18 percent on time uh, uh, deliveries, shipments, I mean, that's a problem. 18 percent. That's where they're at, you know. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, I, I told the guy, I said, no matter where you put your, your pick in the ground, you're going to strike gold. Okay. It doesn't matter, but you got to just sw start swinging the pick. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, because, you know, they could fix themselves, but it's going to uh, take a disruption to the core of their culture. Uh, they got to not be just a sales organization. Oh, the other thing, they're winning 25% of their bids. You know, I, I don't know what businesses uh, win 25% of the bids. Right. You know, uh, you know, I, I would expect somewhere between eight and ten percent would be normal, unless there's only two of you. Like, if you're Boeing and Airbus, chances are, you know, you're going to win twenty five percent of the bids or more. Um, but you know, if you're not Boeing or Airbus, and there's hundreds of you like you in the, in the United States, maybe dozens your size in the United States, you shouldn't be winning twenty five percent. Right. You know, Joe, I was thinking about this, uh, as you had mentioned earlier about uh, the paralysis of analysis. And, and it was something I learned early in my career is, is that when we would get sent back to, yeah, you know, go look at these numbers again. Now, the reason why we were looking at the numbers was, is that the executive didn't like the answer that we gave them. Right. The answer was accurate. The answer was correct. It just wasn't the answer he was looking for. Yeah. And because it wasn't the answer he was looking for, or it was an answer that was unattractive for whatever reason. Uh, no, go back and go study this more. It needs some more study. No, it was 
it was not nothing to do with the numbers at all. It was totally emotional and it was delusional. Right. Well, uh, you know, right? in my case, what I was looking at is, you know, when I got the numbers and they confirmed what I suspected, I had them go over it again because I'm going to go to my boss, you know, the you know, the, the owner of the company, and I'm going to give him my findings. And like you said, he's going to ask me to study him again. And by having, our, you know, by, by already seeing something I don't like, okay, at a magnitude that it was, I would call into question those numbers. So I did the study again, just in case. And I said, I'm not going to study it again. We've already gone over the numbers a couple of times. They're accurate, you know, and, uh, and studying it further is a waste of time. But I think that's, as, as analysts, as consultants, I think that's our re responsibility too, is if something is out of whack, we have to suspect that it might be wrong. Mm -hmm. And we have to double check the numbers first. But if we've double checked the numbers, uh, we have to present it. And if they want us to you know, go over it yet again, I would ask them, what specifically are you asking me to look at you that you think is wrong? Because if you don't think, uh, if you don't have something specific you think is wrong, then I'm wasting my time by looking at it again. Yep. And you're wasting time in making a decision that could fix it. Well, the, the movie quote, I forget, gosh, I can't remember, but you can't handle the truth. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Right? Yeah. The truth. You can't handle the truth. Yeah. Give me the truth. Who was that? Jack uh, Nicholson. Jack, yeah, Nick, yeah. Jack Nicholson and uh and Tom Cruise. Tom Tom Cruise. It was a few that's good right. men. Is that what it was? Yes, a few yep. good. Yeah, exactly. You can't handle the truth. Yeah. And that's I mean, and I'm in a sales role now and in 3PL, I was in sales. You know, a lot of things are done on the basis of, well, we need to grow the top line for our investors or for the market or whatever. And I had an older consultant that, and it kind of sum up what we were saying. He said, yeah, he said, I had a customer tell me once, he said, I'm losing money on every widget, widget but I'm making it up on volume. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> that's epic. That's a, you know, it was funny when, when I first started my business and I was like 30 years ago, um, you know, getting the, you know, getting my feet underneath me, get doing, doing work. And my father would ask me, you know, uh, how's business going? I'd say, man, we're really busy. And he'd look at me and say, yeah, but are you making any money? Yeah. You know, and, and that stuck with me because it reminds me of this client in Florida. They're very busy. Okay, very busy. Everybody's, you know, very, very busy, um, but they're not making any money. And, and, you know, I think that we really have to think about growing the top line, but squeezing that middle. You know, how do we get control of our costs? How do we maintain control of our GNA? Um, yeah, uh, that's the way it is. You know, I, I had a client experience back uh, 2011 food service distributor and uh, out in California. So it had that special California overtime rule that they work over eight hours. They're in the overtime zone and they work more than 10 hours. They're in the double time zone. Whoa. And uh, you know, California is that kind of special place. And uh, uh, so they were really proud at uh, you know, how much they've been growing the top line, how much they've been growing the type of top line. And, and I went through and did it from a financial analysis first. And I said, yeah, I look at how much profit you generated two years ago to last year to this year. And, and actually you're in a, you're approaching contango because your, your uh, revenue continues to go up, but your profitability continues to go down. And as I started to look at it, it was, you guys are spending an incredible amount of money in overtime, an incredible amount of money in the warehouse in overtime. And so we did things that straightened out the flow in the warehouse, which took out a lot of walking, wasted walking. Right. And we cut the distances walked by over half. Uh, simple addition of a, a door in the building. You know, it was the no brainer to me. This is where we got a path. All right. So that was that investment. But the other challenge was, is his, uh, he kept hugging the, oh, I don't mind the overtime at all because we're, by not having to hire additional people, I'm not getting creamed by the benefits. 
Well, then I sat down and started calculating out all the money he spent in overtime. And if he had been spending instead, those hours have been regular time. All right, that's the number of FTEs. And then here's what the incremental cost of the benefits are for adding those FTEs. Well, she whiz, dude, uh, adding those FTEs, your benefits, uh, the increased cost of the benefits is 25%, 22% yeah. of what you're spending on overtime today. Right. And it was, he started to argue against it and, and argue with me about it. But his brother said, no, you know what? You're right. We got to, we got to fix this. And what we also discovered was is a couple of the people who were really banking the overtime were people that were also uh, not helping productivity. Right. And so the next action that they took was a subtraction. They told everybody no overtime. They hired some additional people to come in. And these, there were three individuals that had been milking the OT so much that once they had been cut off from the OT, well, they went and found different jobs. Right. Self-selected out. Self-selected out. And the people who rose into those positions outperformed them. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, it, it, it's, you get somebody who is willing to look at the reality, then that's great. Sometimes people are just blind to the reality. They don't know how to look at it from a different viewpoint. And that's where we come in. Yeah. But there's other folks that even though we can show them the different reality, show them the reality, show them that different view, they don't want to make the change. Ergo, that's why I fire clients every once in a while, because you know what? I can't help you. You're right. Right, right. Well, well speaking, I think that, of, yeah. speaking of firing clients, and we talked about it, and I've and I've shared this example with some uh, customers and and some places where I'd worked is I remember I don't know ten years ago. If I think it was five years ago, it was probably ten. That's that's how my mind works. But I I'll never forget. I saw a big article, AT and T fires like three thousand customers. And, and I looked into the article, I'm like, so they did what we were talking about. There were a group of people that were calling. They wanted to go over their bill every time they got the bill. They wanted to know how to check their, they would call. That They were just excessive use of the resources of AT&T. And they just fired them and said, look, we we're going to cancel our contract and we would appreciate you going somewhere else for your cell phone or phone needs. And clearly somebody did the math and said, these 3000 people are costing us X amount of customer service minutes, which we can't use to grow our business and serve our other customers that are growing and deserve it. And, uh, and, and I think that's what I was, whether you file, fire the order type, you know, maybe mm -hmm. you don't do as many, or maybe you, you, the, the customer type or the product type, you know, it, it's, those are the things that need to be looked at for opportunities. And like you said, as consultants, uh, that's what we do. The other comment that you all were talking about of, you know, I worked for a boss and he said, look, I would much rather have a 70 to 80% solution implemented in two to three weeks than a hundred percent in two months. He's, he's in, in all of my years of third-party logistics at every Q quarterly business review, the same message came from our client. I am paying you to bring me alternative solutions and I want you piloting things to improve my business because we can pilot it for two weeks a month. And then if we don't like it and it's not getting the results, well, we go back to what we're doing today, but right. at least we've tried. Right. I agree hundred percent. Build it, build it fast, break it fast, fix it fast. Oh, that's a good one. Yeah. You know? So listen, I think uh, you know it's been in, into it for an hour there, David. I think uh, perhaps we should have a last call and uh, you know button it up for the day. Yeah, you know, as much as I would love to sit here and keep chewing the fat and uh, <laughs> you know sipping away at the beverage, uh, we 
we have to call it a day at yeah. some point in time, you know, but. Uh, hey, Damien, I hope you come back here sometime. Uh, it was a great pleasure having you at the end. I, no, I will definitely be back because this is helpful for me and I'm always one. And if, like you said, my parting shot would be, I'm grateful to have these discussions. I'm grateful to be involved with the companies I worked or the clients I had because they invited me in and, and allowed me to look and learn and provide my input. And together, let's make the best, uh, let's, let's deliver the best result for the business at the point in time. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, thanks a lot, Damien, for, uh, for joining us. So I think uh, there, Mule, that uh, only one left, uh, one thing left to say is uh, yeah. don't drive like my brother. Well, and don't drive like my brother. All right. Thanks, everybody, for joining us. Thanks. For you next see time. You next, see you next time, folks. listening to another episode of the outliers in with your hosts joseph paris and david schneider this program is produced by the operational excellence society and sponsored by zonatech consulting group international